Good morning or good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. I'm Roger Gilbert and this is the Rongo Rongo Live Video Studio. I'm reporting today for Milling and Grain magazine and I have the pleasure to have in the studio this afternoon Scott Montgomery. He is the director of the Food Fortification Initiative uh, based in the United States, the FFI, and he's actually located in uh, frozen uh, Minneapolis at the moment. Uh, Scott uh, joined the FFI uh, back in 2011, I believe. But let me tell you a little bit about his background before then, because I think this is relevant to today's interview. Uh, Scott received a bachelor degree in milling science and management from Kansas State University uh, in Kansas, and that was in 1980, before he took up a job with Cargill Incorporated and worked there for 30 years, uh, retiring. Uh, in 2010. He began as a trainee at the company's oilseed processing plant in Washington, Iowa. Uh, he quickly moved into the wheat flour milling business and that's the important thing here. He held several uh, advisory, supervisory positions across North America during that time. Uh, Scott assumed responsibility for global operations for Cargill's wheat and maize milling operations and ultimately he w worked in citrus operations in every region of the world. He retired, as I said, in 2010 as Vice President of Global Procurement Leader. Uh, it's great pleasure to welcome uh, Scott to the Rongo Rongo Live studio. Uh, welcome, Scott. Thank you, Roger. I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to speak to you today. Yes, well, welcome. Uh, hopefully, uh, I can call you Scott. Um, oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, look, it's uh, it's timely. We we have a magazine coming up this month uh, where we look at the uh, global fortification data exchange, and uh, that got me thinking that maybe we should be talking to yourself about how how millers should be involved in this fortification issue, uh, which has been around a long time now. But before we get to the nitty gritty, uh, can you tell me a little bit about how you came to hold your current position in the FFI? Sure, it's kind of an interesting story. So I was um, I was living in Australia in, in 2003, and and I was so I was seconded to a joint venture um, company called Allied Mills. It was the largest wheat flour milling company, bakery mix company in in Australia. And the when I returned, I. I went back to my operations role for the global dry milling businesses as well as the others that you mentioned. And coincidentally that shortly after I returned to Minneapolis, the Cargill's public affairs team invited the U.S. Centers for Disease Control to Minneapolis. Right. So again, this was 2004. Hmm. And we had a meeting and I joined the meeting and coincidentally the food for, or at that time it was the flour fortification initiative. And that team had joined, CDC had, had been one of the founding members of FFI. And they started talking about what they do. They started talking about their strong belief in public private civic. And we just, we started some discussions and I was extremely interested in it, particularly involving the private sector, which many development agencies kind of shy away from. Yeah. So we just started some discussions, and and I asked them who's your um, who leads your your executive management team, which is our quasi board, and they said Andrew Lindbergh from the Australian Wheat Board. So I thought, well, that's interesting mm -hmm. um, to to have a mo monopolistic grain trader that's <laughs> yeah. your private sector rep, and, and I say that in jest. Um, yeah. And so they said, well, why doesn't Cargill join hmm. our executive management team? So Cargill started to become a, a financial sponsor of FFI as well as I joined, joined the executive management team. So again, that was 2004. Shortly after that, you'll probably recall the big uh, food for fuel scandals in Iraq. And, yeah. and that was um, Andrew Lindbergh was caught right in the middle of, yeah. of that. He was the managing director of the AWB, so he had to step down as the chair. So I became the chair of the Food Fortification Initiative um, executive management team. But that, I know that's a long story. 
And then in two, in 2010, I decided to retire from Cargill. So I spent mm -hmm. six years strongly supporting FFI as the board chair and working closely with the team. And a, one of my big concerns when I decided to retire from Cargill is I had to replace myself on the FFI board or EMT. And one of our members, his name was Greg Harvey, who was the, the um, CEO of um, Interflower based out of Singapore one of the largest milling companies in Southeast Asia. And I asked him to replace me mm -hmm. as the board chair. And then in turn, he asked me, why don't you work with us then with FFI? So mm -hmm. I became the industry liaison, obvious for obvious reasons. And then it, within a few months, we had a real gap in leadership and Greg Harvey asked me if I would be the director of FFI. So that's the, that's, the that's long story. The long story. but. Why did you change your, I mean, you were 30 years with Cargill, uh, maybe not that close to retirement anyway, uh, some might say. Uh, why did you see the move, mo what motiva motivated you to move into the food fortification side? Was it just um, to help or did, had you some experience uh, behind you there? Well, I had, I had spent six years working with the, the team, the FFI team, as the board chair. I was a pretty active mm -hmm. uh, board chair. We'd have monthly calls. And I felt um, somewhat helpless at times because I had a full-time job, yeah. full-time job plus. And, but you develop a real passion for this. It, it's, it's such incredible work that can be done globally, and mm -hmm. it's so... Um, cost effective, you know, in, in in the private sector, we talk about payback or cost benefit ratios. Mm. And I approved multi million dollar capital investments while at Cargill, mm. but I'd never seen the payback numbers of simply fortifying um, wheat flour with vitamins and minerals. It's incredible. Mm. So the, the cost is minuscule and the benefits are unbelievable. Mm. And, and do you think that the industry, the flour milling industry, and you have a lot of experience uh, globally in the flour milling sector, do you think the flour milling industry is, is fully aware of the impact that uh, fortification has, or is it sort of like a cost, they don't see the cost benefit, so to speak? It's, it's mixed, and, and that's a message we're trying to put out right now. So, for example, we're, we're currently working with Kansas State University on their milling curriculum, they talk about um, in ingredients and ingredient feeders, flour improvers, and that includes talking a bit about uh, vitamins and mineral addition through premix. But we're we're working with them to really tell that story. This is one, number one. I don't fortify anything. I don't add vitamins and minerals to anything. I'm in a development agency now. Yeah. Um, so who does? The millers. Yeah. We had a miller at an IOM meeting that, that attended one of our meetings and then he opened the IOM meeting. At, this was in uh, Cape Town. And he, he was so impressed he, and he told the millers, this is where the rubber hits the road. This is what we do, hmm. the millers. And, and we're trying to incorporate into that training how incredibly important it is to do this, why we do it how many birth defects we can e eliminate globally and what that opportunity is. So really trying to very early as, as millers are being trained to impress on them that this is critical work that you do um, yeah. and, and you do it. Is that, Sorry. Me, is that me or yourself? <laughs> I'm going to... Hmm. I mean, it's, it is incredible work that is being done. And uh, do, do you see the change that's happened in the time that you've been with the FFI since 2004? You know, that's 15, 16 years now. I, we've evolved a long ways. And, and we one thing that I um, have really impressed on our team and that we've done is that we've mapped the world by region we started in Africa. We mapped the burden of disease in those countries, but but more importantly, we mapped what's the industrial milling infrastructure and what's the opportunity to fortify. Mm. So so we're um, 
supporting the compulsory fortification of cereal grains mandated by the government that all industrial mills fortify. That makes a level playing field for the millers and we work with the governments to, to monitor those programs so it is a level playing field for the millers. Um, the cost to fortify a one metric ton of wheat flour is about one to two dollars. Yeah, okay. So it's it's a fraction of the, the retail value or the wholesale value of flour. But that being said, I was a miller and I understand two dollars a ton. I mean, it's not computer chips, right? Yeah. This is a commodity wheat flour for the most part. Yeah. And two dollars means something. So we have to have compliance to level playing field for the millers. And then it just becomes part of the way they do business. Mm. So do you think in a country, and, and I know there's uh, very few now, something like 60 plus countries that are not fortifying for fluoric acid. Uh, do, you, do you think that it is a national decision that has to be taken, uh, not just an individual flour miller's decision? We support mandatory fortification. Mm. And th I believe there's 84 countries now that have mandatory fortification. The, the, the models when I started working with um, FFI and, and some of the development partners were pushing out, let's, let's convince the millers to voluntarily fortify. Yeah. And then, they, then the millers would have to market why they, they're doing that to sell their product. And unfortunately, globally, there is simply no appetite for the masses to pay more yeah. for that wheat flour, particularly um, those most vulnerable people. Mm -hmm. now, yeah. Maybe you'd reach the high end of the market, but that's not what our target is. Yeah. So our target's the most vulnerable. Yeah, and uh, I mean it has a huge impact, of course. You know, it's obvious when you see it. It's, but to my mind, here we are in a pandemic, uh, COVID uh, nineteen situation, and yet we're finding all the funding we need to save lives from COVID by developing a vaccine and and vaccinating the world's population, yet we find it a bit of a struggle to um, to do the same for unborn children uh, or for pregnant women. Uh, you know, does that sort of like um, equate with you? Do you think that there should be more focus at this this end of the of the age spectrum and not just focused on the other end? Uh, maybe it's a bit of a hot potato, but you know, you might. That, that's a that's a great point you bring up. So, um, so my answer is absolutely. Th this whole segment is is underfunded globally, and I'm not talking about just FFI. And so, why is that? Um, th that's a good question. And you know, it, it's not you know something really cool. This has been going on for years. You know, it's not something new. And, and for, for some reason, and maybe we need to tell our story better, um, this is such an incredible intervention. And I, I don't know, if one analogy I could make is that iodized salt, which started you know, I, I, many, many, many years ago, that's been um, used as an example of one of the most significant public health interventions in history simply adding a bit of iodine to salt. That's kind of where the idea of adding vitamins and minerals to, to cereal grains came from. Mm. And so, again, the analogy is great, and, and the story for wheat, flour, rice, maize should be the same. Mm. And we are, we, we currently estimate 30% of the world's um, industrial milled wheat flour is fortified. So we got, we got a ways to go. Less than 1% of the rice is fortified. Mm. And maize, um, it's probably thirty to forty percent is fortified. Mm -hmm. Maize, there are there are a lot of smaller mills that are are, are very difficult to yeah. to reach and yeah. and fortify. But the industrial mills, um, we we estimate about thirty percent. Yeah, yeah. So um, finally, um, do you have a vision about where fortification? is going universally and and how are we going to achieve that how important is the miller's role in supporting this vision that y you have so so 
I, I sometimes tell people when I work for Cargill I, and woke up in the morning, there's no doubt my job was to increase the profits of Cargill, to sustain Cargill's businesses, to make money, so to speak. When I wake up in the morning now, I want to prevent the burden of micronutrient deficiencies globally. That, that's what I wake up to do. You mentioned healthy babies, pregnant mothers. Um, it's estimated that a billion people, two billion people suffer from anemia. Um, I might not quite have that number, right? But, uh, and, and that's what I wake up in the morning we're trying to achieve. So my vision or, or what my dream might be a better way to put that is that we eliminate the micronutrient deficiencies of, of two billion people across the world that suffer those deficiencies. And with the outcome of uh, reducing anemia, um, the birth defects, um, the, the health of, of women of childbearing age, etc. That, that's, what, that's what my vision and goal is. Mm. That's why I do this work. Yeah, and and do you see Miller's having been one? Do you see Miller's playing uh, a, a critical role in that process? Miller's Miller's are the critical um, players in there. It's the Miller's that add the premix and fortify, and and I find the Miller's very very cooperative and willing to to support this work. They do want a level playing field, and I understand that, and we try and work very closely with the Miller's to. Um, put the proper programs in, the proper monitoring, working with the government. But but the Millers are absolutely critical. And and the Millers should be proud. Mm. If they're fortifying their wheat flour with folic acid, with iron, the impact that they're making on the public health of their country or their state is incredible. Mm. Uh, and and the, the evidence is irrefutable. So Again, that's where I, I, I have some real passion that this is just something that we have to do and we have to get after it. I'm not real patient about it. I just want to get it done. Yeah. Well, we're right behind you there. We publish lots of stories around this subject and we're looking forward to seeing your interview in the magazine as well as on our Rongo Rongo Live uh, through social media. But uh, Scott, thank you very much for joining us today. It's been a fabulous uh, interview. Wish you all the best with this. And um, yeah, thank you for being so passionate about what you're doing. But uh, thank you and goodbye. Thank you, Roger. Goodbye. <laughs>